factories are getting smarter by the day, it seems. Long gone are the days when old school sensors that only communicated one way ruled the roost. Today's smart factories include robotics, cloud management, and a whole lot of sensors. But in order to keep all of those components communicating nicely together and reporting diagnostics back to us, we need a standardized interface. But where would we find that kind of interface that can provide two-way communication for new and older industrial environments alike? Right here, my friends. Right here. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Safety, flexibility, and sustainability are cornerstone to today's smart factories. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Shasta Thomas from Analog Devices and I discuss how Analog Devices' IO Link is helping usher in a new era of smart factory automation. We take a closer look at the benefits that IO Link can bring to an industrial factory environment the biggest issues facing IO Link sensor and master designs, and how analog devices can help you with your next industrial design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. Hi Shasta, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so what is driving the push toward smart factory digitization? It seems like it's a hot topic right now versus maybe 10 years ago. Right, so it is. Trends driving to move towards smart factory includes things like flexible manufacturing. This means that our factory floors can do more faster, collect data, be convertible so that they can do one product and then do another one very quickly. It includes things like process optimization, so we have less errors, remote serviceability, so that we don't need a guy walking around on the factory floor all the time to reset devices and do error checks manually. It means that we can do on-demand diagnostics to check that everybody's okay on the floor and to do fast and repeatable measurements and conversions in not exactly real time, but pretty close to real time. It also means that there's less need for humans on the floor. So that increases safety and reduces cost. And it means that we have an increased sustainability. So everything can keep running, keep running well, and give us the information and the product output that we need. That makes sense. Now, Shasta, the intelligent edge, it seems to have enabled a lot of possibilities in the smart factory space. Can you give us some context um, as why that is? Sure. So the intelligent edge just essentially means that we can get the data and the information fast and reliably all the way from the control center down to the sensors and devices on the factory floor. So historically, an analog sensor would collect data and it could send it back to the controller, but there was no two-way communication. It was one way only. Also, an analog sensor involved a lot of things. You had your sensing element, and then you needed to take this analog signal from the sensing element, turn it into a digital signal that your microcontroller could understand. But then your microcontroller had to take the digital signal and turn it back to an analog signal, so we had a D to 80, then transfer it over, and then your controller had to do the whole thing again. So there was a convoluted process. It definitely worked, but it had a lot of issues, including you know just the sheer number of components components you need and the possibility of noise making it into the line and messing with your data, plus the fact that you could only talk one way. Additionally, we had things called binary sensors, so that was the next step. And they were an improvement for sure, but still very limited. Say communication was only one way, and they, it's really more like turning on a switch. They can say yes, they can say no, but other than that, there really wasn't much that the controller could gather from that. The intelligent edge is looking to take that to the next level, essentially. We want to be able to talk back to the sensors, to configure the sensors, to be able to both get data, but also communicate so that the entire process and the sensors themselves become convertible and accessible. 
with the Intelligent Edge, we want to be able to communicate with the sensor. The sensor can give us data, but we also need to check how things are going. We want to be able to configure the sensor to maybe change the way it operates sometimes or thresholds. And so with the Intelligent Edge, we're pushing that level of communication out to allow a lot of new operations that we just previously were not able to achieve. The Intelligent Edge, as ADI is seeing it, and as a lot of our factory digital customers are doing it, happens through a number of different interfaces. We have a field bus, which is essentially some sort of process control, a very high level one, which then needs to be able to communicate in some way to all of the sensors and actuators and things down the line. In this case, we're gonna talk about the communication interface called IO-Link. So IO-Link technology is not a field bus. It's a common misconception. It's not here to replace a field bus. In fact, what it does, it's ag agnostic. It works with any field bus and is a, used solely to communicate between the sensors and the field bus. So it's based on a three-wire communication line using unshielded cables and M12 connectors. All of these things have been used in industrial processing for years, decades even. So it was based and designed for factory floors already in process to make it a cheap transition and to make it an easy transition when the factory is capable of doing it. This installation is very simple using the standardized cables and connectors using a three-wire interface, using all of the same things that the binaries or old analog sensors were capable of, but now in a new way. Additionally, IO-Link brings to the table the ability to communicate back and forth between what's called an IO-Link master, or the one step below the field bus, <laughs> and the devices. So it can gather diagnostics, it gathers data, it simplifies maintenance, and it includes software capability using something called an IODD file, which we can talk about in a little more detail down the way. And it simplifies remote configuration. So the field bus doesn't have to pay attention to every sensor. It's only paying attention to the IO link master who is paying attention to every sensor connected to it. So it offloads from the field bus this very complex level of communication. And then is able to tell it, the field bus controller, what it needs. So what it does essentially is it brings that intelligent edge out to the actual sensor from the field bus and communicates or translates between the two, allowing faster, more reliable data. So Shasta, what are the biggest issues when it comes to smart factory sensor and IO link master development? I would imagine that it's traditionally a pretty harsh environment to operate in. Yes. Um, industrial floors are very harsh environments. You have a lot of high voltage, you have a lot of high voltage switching, so you have transients, you have a lot of electromagnetic um, signals radiating. So some of the biggest issues for IO-Link devices that we come across are obviously software, but we'll discuss that in more detail later. We have heat, we have size, and we have robustness. So we'll talk about heat first. IO-Link sensors and devices um, come in very small housings. This is because as we push the intelligent edge further out, we actually have um, a higher density of these devices on a network. And because you have so many, but only so much physical space, things get smaller and smaller and smaller very quickly. So what we end up with is these very highly integrated, highly capable devices in these very small housings. So like what we see here is this tiny housing, which is 12 millimeters by 50 millimeters. And inside of this, we have a sensor and the sensor will heat up as it operates. So an IO-Link device heats up for a number of reasons. The two primary ones are the actual driver switching of the transceiver and power. So an IO-Link device is powered from 
the IO-Link Master with a 24 volt supply. IO-Link is a 24 volt switching signal, so that makes sense. But most of the circuitry on the IO-Link device does not need 24 volts. It operates at digital voltage levels, which are more like 5 volts, 3.3 volts, even 1.8 volts. So stepping down your 24 volts to a digital level results in a large power dissipation, depending on how you do it. Historically, customers have used external DC to DC step-down circuits which help to reduce the power significantly. All IO-Link transceivers that I have ever seen include integrated linear regulators, but anybody who knows anything about a linear regulator knows that that's going to result in a huge power or a huge heat dissipation from the part stepping down. So an integrated DC to DC is a better option. We see here on this slide, we have four devices without integrated DC to DCs that are using linear regulators to step down the 24 volts to a 5 volt source. And then the last one shows a part with an integrated DC to DC. You can see in this one, this is a thermal camera, that the bottom one is obviously producing less heat. The interesting part here is that the heat that you're seeing is actually the load resistor. So even less heat than you think you're seeing is being produced by the part itself. The other major factor in heat dissipation is the, are the drivers themselves on a transceiver. Drivers can be used to drive large capacitive loads, inductive loads, resistive loads. They can need to drive large currents for short periods of time, but all of this results in heat. So the major way to reduce that heat is to reduce the on resistance of the drivers. The devices shown in the slide here on the left, you can see four different devices, all of which have different on resistances. And it's very clear the difference that an on resistance makes. Now, all of these vary within a factor of two ohms to eight ohms. So it's not even a huge difference, but you can see that there are large differences in the amount of heat that's generated driving a small load for a short time. The way that we battle heat for our customers and that customers battle heat is to find either an external DC to DC or to use an integrated one and to choose a device with a very low on resistance. Other issues include the size, the robustness, and the drive capability. The size we've kind of touched on already. As sensors and devices increase on factory floors, their sizes have to decrease. That's all we can do. With that comes the issue of power dissipation and heat, but also just sheer space. There isn't a lot of space on one of these circuit boards to put a lot of components. So what we're showing here is that there's different ways to handle the layout. But also you can see the difference between how layout comes into play here, where we have, say, a DC to DC next to the transceiver, in this case, the WOP, or we have to use both sides, and the reduction in board size as well. So package sizes become very important here, where we minimize the package size of an IO-Link transceiver. The integration becomes important. Can we reduce the number of external components that are needed? All of this comes into play when trying to reduce the size as well as then trying to reduce the heat. Robustness is another one. Sensors must survive the harsh industrial conditions we mentioned earlier. So the IO-Link standard has some requirements for ESD performance and EFT, or commonly known burst performance. And these are just high voltage transients tested in certain ways to certain levels and parts have to be able to just survive them or depending on the performance you're shooting for, survive and continue to function with them. Interestingly for IO-Link as well, it does not require any protection of surge, which is another high voltage transient. But we have found that most device designers, sensor designers in the field do require some level of surge protection. So 
transceivers and IO-Link devices need to be designed to account for that as well. The surge protection typically is relaxed a little bit for IO-Link devices where they use 500 ohms instead of the 42 ohms in the IEC standard, but it's still a significant power surge that needs to be protected against. Additionally, IO-Link devices must be able to drive 200 milliamps per channel. This is not so much an issue as most of the transceivers I've ever seen can handle that, but what it does do is it factors into keeping the power dissipation low and keeping the part robust. So we probably won't go into great deal for IO-Link masters, but they face similar design concerns as the devices. Heat, robustness, in this case drive capability, and software. An IO-Link master, as shown here, isn't as small as an IO-Link device. But what it is required to do is to communicate with multiple devices connected to it almost continuously, nearly simultaneously. An IO-Link master typically is built to service anywhere between four and eight IO-Link devices at any one time. So this level of communication almost constantly is going to generate a significant amount of heat. So the IO-Link master is still concerned with heat. IO-Link master transceivers do still need to have low on resistance and they do need to be aware and their power schemes need to be carefully designed. IO-Link masters must survive the same ESD and EFT or bursts that IO-Link devices must be able to withstand. Most customers require some level of surge protection. In this case, the surge level is not relaxed, so they would use the 42 ohms. This requires pretty significant size protective diodes, so that needs to be taken into account as well. IO-Link masters must be able to overdrive any device connected to it, so they have to be able to drive at least 500 milliamps per channel, which is significantly higher than a device. While they don't have to do this regularly, it is still a part of normal communication and configuring a device. So this does contribute to power dissipation and requires some consideration for heat design. Additionally, what IO-Link devices don't have to be concerned about, but an IO-Link master does, is communication timing. An IO-Link master must be able to, like I said, communicate nearly constantly with up to 4, 8, 16 devices at a time. And this makes timing, meeting to meet the IO-Link spec, timing becomes tight and needs to be tightly controlled. Something called an IO-Link stack becomes very important here. ADI works with three of the leading software partners who handle IO-Link stacks globally to generate these high functional and reliable software stacks that help a part to be IO-Link compliant for timing. So Shasta, keeping these design challenges in mind, how do people narrow in on what IO-Link device transceiver they should be using? Right. So it's funny because it almost always starts with roughly the same questions. One, what am I building? How big can it be? What sort of protection do I need? And what sort of power scheme am I looking for? An IO-Link device, as a couple of examples here I have, my device must be very small. So my heat becomes very important and I need to choose a transceiver that has a really high power dissipation rating. Additionally, my power scheme is important. How am I going to get that 24 volts down to the level that the rest of the logic circuitry needs in the most efficient possible way? In this case, a transceiver with an integrated DC to DC would be ideal. Additionally, the part should have a small footprint. And obviously, for robustness purposes, if the device must be very small, you're going to want something that has either integrated protection or has a very flexible power scheme. So I've listed here a few of the transceivers that ADI makes that would meet these scenarios. Another example would be for a customer who's looking to build a circuit that could be used in multiple types of devices. 
So they want high flexibility. They still need good power dissipation and a small footprint, maybe not as necessarily as my device must be very small, but robustness also is important. In this case, customers will want something that has a flexible power scheme. So an integrated DC to DC could be useful, or maybe they want something that has other options available for stepping down the power. What might be considered here is the flexibility of the design. How many operational modes do I have? How many channels can I use? How can I do that in the smallest possible footprint with the simplest possible interface? In this case, something like having a device with a CQ interface line, that's your line to and from the IOLink master, plus DO and DI binary channels would be useful for any future things. Additionally, robustness almost always comes into play. You want something with proven protection, probably integrated protection to help reduce extra size and provide protection as well as flexible protection options where external protection might be required to meet standards that the integrated protection is not necessarily designed to meet. So Shasta, can you give us an idea of the types of solutions and sensors typically found in a smart factory environment? Of course. So in a smart factory environment, we're collecting data usually or trying to move something. So you have a lot of sensors like temperature sensors, is something warm enough, cool enough? Is a threshold being exceeding? You have pressure sensors. Are fluids moving? You have position sensors. Have motors moved? Are robot arms moving? But essentially, we have a lot of different sensors that take a lot of data, move things, position things correctly. So it runs the gamut. We have optical sensors. We have different types of temperature sensors. We have digital hubs which allow more sensors to be connected. We have binary sensors, which like I said, are just turning something on and off. Anything you can think of can be an IO-Link sensor. Additionally, we have IO-Link masters. While they don't have a specific sensor operation, they communicate with all of the sensors to collect the data, package it, and send it forward, as well as performing the diagnostics on each sensor and keeping the sensors that are connected up and running. So ADI has a huge portfolio of transceivers and devices that can be used and are used regularly in all of these types of sensors. We have reference designs that cover most of these types of sensors, including temperature, proximity, distance. We have master reference designs. We have a portfolio that highlights multiple different types of sensors and how they work in a system together. So Shasta, I think anyone new to IO Link will have gotten a great introduction today, but as we have discussed a whole lot of information, can you summarize the main takeaways for Smart Factory and IO Link? What should people keep in mind? One, IO Link is a standardized in- interface which was designed to simplify configurations. It's based on existing industrial standard cables, connectors, and communication. It adds to systems already in place, but builds on systems also. It allows near real-time diagnostics. Most importantly, allows two-way communication between a control and any IO-Link sensor or device. Design considerations for these sensors including power dissipation and size and robustness, do require some special attention. But there are a number of designs and reference designs already available to kind of help guide people through those. So a lot of the work has already been done, and there's lots of information to help get you started. Lastly, ADI has solutions that are optimized to ease design. We have our reference designs, Our transceivers are built with all of these design considerations in mind, and we have the expertise to help. Okay, so Shasta, if someone wanted to take the next step in learning more about IO-Link and its use in smart factory automation, where do you recommend they begin? The ADI website is a great place to start. 
we have what we call the IOLINK Handbook, which is a very comprehensive user guide to getting started with IOLINK. Explains IOLINK in detail, goes over binary sensors, and then also discusses our reference designs and our various transceivers in great detail. We have multiple videos and presentations to help get you started. And we also have multiple reference designs, some of which I mentioned before, but sort of our showcase panel of them is shown here where you can see our master reference design connected to multiple different types of the device designs to kind of have a whole network that you can order to get a feel for IOLINK, get started with IOLINK, and get things up and running quickly. Fantastic. Well, Shasta, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from analog devices. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>